In this section, we continue discussing controlling events. How do we control events? As I have mentioned before, we cannot control events, but there are some things that we can do about events. First, we must have a plan. Very briefly, first, we need to have a plan because of two reasons. First, if the context of our project is simple uh, or complicated, our plan will help us to navigate, to coordinate activities, resources, and people. However, if our project is in the complex or chaos context, if we are talking about the Kinefi model, for example, we need a plan to show stakeholders that we know how to manage the project. We need to provide a sense of confidence to everyone that the project is under control. Of course, we know that the plan will change because it's a complex project. Another aspect, reason why we need a plan is because plans need to be simple so everybody will understand and they need to be logic. Human beings like rationality and dislike the unknown. The second thing that we can do regarding events is that we cannot control, of course, events, but we can shape people's perceptions about events. How do we shape people's perceptions and interpretations regarding events? In order to answer these questions, we need to consider that in complex projects in uncertain situations, the most significant organizational decisions are usually the outcome of social and political processes. They are only partially influenced by evidence and rational arguments. So, by helping to interpret events, we can influence people how events are perceived. Most of us prefer order and predictability most of the time. People who have the ability to reduce uncertainty gain reputations and position of influence. So, how can we reduce uncertainty in a situation? By offering a clear definition of the problem and also by specifying boundaries, stages, interfaces of the problem, we can help to restore a sense of order in a confusing situation, that is, in a situation of complex or chaos situations. Note that the problem was not solved. We have only defined the problem, provide a simple definition, and specify some of the boundaries or stages of the problem. We have not solved the problem, but this will provide this sense of order, and this helps to shape people's perceptions. This means that shaping people's perceptions is related to political tactics and influencing tactics. That is, is related to power and politics. And the topic of power and politics in project management we will touch in our next module. Here we have an example of influencing tactics. Please read it on your own time. What is the relationship between project complexity and shaping people's perceptions? In projects with lower level of complexity, we use conventional project management tools to convince people. That is, we use tools that are based on rational arguments, such as, for example, PMI project management models are suitable to address projects that are conventional, that have lower level of, com of complexity. In, in the case of the models that I have presented so far, we this referred to projects in which their diamond, when we illustrate the diamonds, is small. That is, they have lower level of complexity or uncertainty in each of the four dimensions of the diamond model. In the A-feature model, we are referring to quadrants one and two that are also more simple, more conventional. Or in the Kinefi model, we refer to simple and complicated contexts in which the level of complexity is either low or is medium term. Now, if we are talking about projects with high level of complexity, that is projects which have a larger diamond, higher levels of project complexity in terms of technological uncertainty, novelty, 
or in the case of the a feature models, projects that fall in quadrants four or quadrant three, and in the case of kinefin model, projects that can be mapped in the complex or chaos situations. In these projects, rational approach do not work. We need to use power and politics to shape people's perceptions. That is, we need to use power and politics to influence people. Also, we should use complexity arguments to cope with unexpected events. And this is the point that we will see next. Another thing that we can do regarding events is managing the unexpected. So how do we cope with the unexpected events? Carl Bake is a, an academic who did a research in organizations that are highly complex to operate and where a small mistake can lead to a major disaster. So he investigated what those organizations do and how people organize this type of organizations. He called them high reliability of organizations, HRO. In the following slides, I will explain first the key concepts of high reliability organizations. And in the second part, I will explain the principles of high reliability organization. Nuclear, aircraft carriers, and air traffic control systems, teams, are examples of high reliability organizations. They have no choice but to be a reliable organization. That is, they should never fail, because if they fail, a major catastrophe, disaster, may happen. These organizations use complex technology, have different stakeholders, and people who run those organizations are like us. They have incomplete information regarding what is going on, and they have incomplete understanding of the whole system because it's a very large system. Of course, there are different people who know very well, they are specialists on the different parts of the system, but there's no one person who understands 100% the whole system. In the case of aircraft carriers, uh, somebody said that <clears throat> they are the most dangerous four and a half acres in the world. They have on the top 80 aircraft with fuels and bomb. The deck is slippery with a mix of seawater and oil, and the noise of jet engines makes communication very difficult. Yet, people who run those operations are people like us, as I have already mentioned, they are specialists in part of the system, but they have incomplete information about the whole system. They have incomplete understanding about the whole system. How do they do that? This is what we will see in this unit. Air traffic control teams are another example of high reliability organizations. They cannot fail because a failure means disasters. This figure provides an idea of the complexity of air traffic control teams. This is a real figure of the San Francisco International Airport. And as you can see, the parting and arrival roads, they cross in different points. They need to make sure that at any point, there is no two aircraft at in the same time and in the same space. That is, a small mistake in the air traffic control team may result in something like this. In other situations, we can have worse outcomes like this. We know that breakdowns or unexpected events happen all the time. Some of them are big deal, others are not. But how do we differentiate them? That is an issue. Usually, we tend to settle for the first explanation that we came to our mind. That makes us to feel in control of the situation. That explanation turns the unknown into known. And this makes this explanation to look like true. But we know that it is not necessarily true. Then, what we need to do is to treat the unknown as something that is knowable. Breakdowns, we know that are the outcome 
of a series of small failures. Small failures, when one small failure combined with other small failures, produces a larger, a, a bigger outcome that is unknown. And that larger, bigger outcome can still combine with another small failure and produce another larger, bigger, and unknown outcome. Also, breakdowns happen when, when those small failures go unnoticed. Or if we notice, we do not pay attention. We take frontline operations for granted. We do simple diagnoses of situations that are new to us. Or we interpret new situations are as all familiar situations. And this is the best recipe for failure. What we need to do is to look at processes that produce an ongoing focus on small failures. We need to look at processes that help us to avoid oversimplify actions. We need to look at processes that help us to not to take for granted operations. Processes that help us to find alternative solutions or options. And we need to ask experts in specific matters in order to better understand the situations. Organizations that look at these areas can help us to make breakdowns more knowable. And that is the point of this managing the unexpected. We need to try to understand situations that are unknown to us. And for that, we need to use some of the processes that I have already mentioned. Our expectations also play a role on how do we manage unexpected events. To have an expectation is to envision something that is likely to happen. To expect something is to be ready mentally for it. This is because expectations about how our world operates serve as implicit assumptions that guide our behavioral choices. So, our expectations create thinking biases that may impact in a neg negative way how do we deal with complexity. Expectations direct our attention to particular features of an event and by default, we do not pay attention to other features of the event. And this is an issue when we are dealing with complex situations. This brings two problems. The first one is related that, to the point that our default mode of thinking is the rational linear model. This means that we assume that everything has a cause and effect relationship. We assume that there is a sequence of steps to address an issue. And this means that we assume that we know what will happen and how. This way of thinking is useful in simple contexts or situations, but is, but is very limited in complex situations. The second problem is that we unconsciously cherry pick information that fits our existing worldviews. This means that also we have overconfidence and optimistic bias. This means that when we analyze a problem, we unconsciously focus on aspects which are familiar to us. And at the same time, we overlook, ignore, or underestimate aspects that we do not know. And this is truer in situations that are difficult, that are complex, and when we do not have time, that is when we are under pressure. So what we need to avoid this cherry picking of information and overconfidence, optimistic bias, what we need is a different lenses that help us to be aware that we are in a different situation, that we are in a different context. In this unit, we are looking at one of these lenses. However, the Kinefi model is another lens that helps us to know that we are in a different context. Can be the same project, 
but in a different context means that we need to manage the project in a very different way. So, managing the unexpected is about sense making. It's about updating your expectations, updating the way we interpret the world. And this is what we call mindfulness. The contrary of mindfulness is mindlessness. And here we have an example about the unknown and the role of our expectations in mindlessness. In this example, sh uh, this example shows the danger of settling by the first explanation and just following our expectations. In May 1987, this ferry sank five minutes after left the dock with its doors open. 195 people die. The problem was order 0109. In simple terms, this order was to report deficiencies or problems that may happen. If there was no report, the master assumes that everything is okay. This rule make people to work on automatic pilot. Rule 0109 provided confirmation of an assumption that was not true in this case. The reason was that the seaman in charge of doors had fallen asleep. Then, of course, the master did not hear anything from this person and assumed that everything was fine and ordered the departure of the ship. This is a, in a very classical case of mindlessness because there were strong expectations that the plan would work. Past experience confirmed this. Additionally, Order 10109 prevented any verification by the master and everybody acted on automatic pilot. This was the outcome was of course a dis a disaster, and we can we can account this disaster by the strong expectations and by the rules that were uh, deployed in this specific case that helped to people to think on automatic pilot without challenging any assumptions. The ferry example illustrates the idea of mindlessness. That is, is the situation when people follow recipes, when we use all categories to classify what we see. It is the case when we operate in automatic pilot. It is the case when we mislabel new and familiar situations with familiar ones. An important silent contribution to mindlessness are plans. And of course, remember that we are talking about complex situations or unknown situations. Plans play a similar role than expectations because plans guide people to search for confirmation the plan is correct. We naturally avoid evidence that does, that does contradict our plans. And I will give you a very simple example. Actually, it's a real world example that's happened with somebody who I know. Uh, you know, from time to time, uh, in these stores, they make sales to sell things, of course. In this case, Harvey Norman have on sale computers at 99, at $1,000. So, but we know that also they sell other computers at $2,000, $3,000, and $4,000. So, this person who I know got a plan, and the plan was get a new computer. And when this person saw the ad about the sale at $1,000, he said, yes, I will get a new computer at $1,000. Now, when he arrived to the store, the salesperson told him, sorry, there are no more $1,000 computers. But 
we do have this two thousand dollars computer that are really good, and we have this three thousand dollars computer that is the best of all computers. So this person ignored the evidence that is there are no more one thousand dollar computer and still went ahead with his plan and bought a laptop of two thousand dollars, for example. Mindlessness happened in this situation because there were confusing signals. First, he saw a sign of cheap computers, but he didn't verify the quality of the cheap computers. And he didn't verify that the availability of enough cheap computers at $1,000. He relied on all categories. He thought that sales means that all computers are on sale at low price. It was, of course, not true. They had some specific brands of computer at low price, at $1,000, and also they have, let's say, five units in every store. Not all computers on sale. So this person, what's happening is that he acted in automatic pilot. He had a plan to buy a computer, and he went and bought even if the evidence showed him that there was no more $1,000 computers. This is the, a typical case of mindlessness. People following recipes, people going on automatic pilot without thinking. Thus, we need to use mindfulness in order to deal with our thinking biases, in order to deal with our expectations. Mindfulness, as you can see in this slide, is really a mental orientation it's an ongoing refinement of our categories that we use to differentiate different situations. And this needs to be, this is a capability that we need to develop over time in order to appreciate the context, how the context change and how we can deal with the new context. Here we have a definition of mindfulness. And the key point in this definition is that we need to develop a capability and effort to monitor weak signals of potential threats, of potential mistakes, even if they are small. Why? Because we know when we have two small mistakes, they can combine and form a larger mistake that will have a larger negative outcome. So we need to monitor this continuously in order to take adaptive actions, in order to avoid, to, to delete those small, small sign, signs, because otherwise they can compose into a larger and complex change of unintended consequences. And we will be in trouble in that case. This quote is from a professor who has spent 30 years working in hospitals, improving hospitals. And I like this quote because it's basically saying that if we do not have the right lenses or the right categories, we will be unable to see or to hear and to miss all issues that even they are in front of our eyes. And that is the point in this managing the unexpected unit. I will provide to you with some principles in order to provide to you with categories to see things before they may become complex. And also there, as you can remember, the Kinefin model also is one tool that helps us to differentiate different, different situations or when situations change. And this is what we will do in this unit. Here we have another example of how plans and expectations blinded, blinded people regarding a situation. This is the Black Saturday in 2009 fires in Victoria. This is a, now a classical example of mindlessness. And this happened in Marysville, Victoria. Uh, this place was totally destroyed by a storm fire. However, minutes before the destruction, people was 
in the restaurants, in the hotels, in the swimming pool, listening music, relaxing, and they were some sort of unconscious of the danger that were, they were exposed. Other people got a sense of security by those around them. Uh, the journalist who wrote a piece in the Australian about this specific case, she was there in Marysville in a hotel, and she said that she saw uh, one kilo, a one-kilometer column of gray and orange smoke. And people, there were around 30 people on the swimming pool, and all of them seemed to be blind to the smoke that filled half of the sky. Nobody was concerned. Nobody said anything. The journalist who was in this swimming pool, despite that she was feeling very uneasy, she decided that the smoke must be something within the normal around here and there's nothing to worry too much about this. So it looks like everybody was blind or deaf. So what's happened to their internal early warning systems in this case? One explanation is that this was a case of collective mindset of complacency, or in other terms, there was a collective mindlessness. What is the point here? Is that people who were in Marsville ignored weak signals at the beginning, and they also ignored strong signs late in the day. They had powerful expectations of getting holidays. This was a, a, a holiday place. Marsville was a holiday place. So people, they got their iPods and computers and cameras and with no knowledge of fire plants or the local geography beyond their address of their accommodation and the name of the best restaurant in town, they went out because they wanted to switch off and to get some days off. Of course, they have already paid a $200, day, a $200 per day accommodation, so they said, yes, I will go to, to have some days off. I deserve that. I have worked too much. And this was despite, a few days before, far authorities, they mentioned that there was a very dangerous combination of heat, drive, and wind in Melbourne. The day before, the Premier, John Brumby, issued another order. He went on TV and on radio and said, don't go outside your house unless it is absolutely necessary. However, as I mentioned, people had plans and power, powerful expectations, such as the holiday makers. On the other hand, other people, such as the hotel and restaurant owners, also they had their own plans. Remember, they had to make the most of their business because they were in the high season. In this season, they earn more or around 70% of their whole yearly income. So they need to keep their plan despite the high risk of fire. The consequence of all this is that more people were killed in Marsville on that year than in any other community as a result of the fires. As we can see here, plans and expectations were the perfect recipe for disaster. In dynamic situations, situations that change, we need a map to explore unknown terrain in order to know when we are entering into an unknown situation, such as in the case of Marysville. A map is not only a rational decision or coordination device, but also gives the team members a feeling of security in a sea of unexpected events that are in many cases hard to interpret. The following story illustrates the functions of maps. This case, a real case, it was a military drill in the Swiss Alps. A small group of people was sent to the ice wilderness. Supposedly they had to be there for two days and after that come back. 
the unit did not re return to its base after four days. Everybody thought that they were dead. But after five days, they returned. So what's happening? What, how they made their way back? One of the team members found a map in his pocket. This calmed them. Um, they were able to set up a camp. There was a significant storm. They waited for the storm to end. And with the help of the map, map they discovered their way out. When they arrived, Captain discovered that the map was not the map of the Alps, but it was the map of the Pyrenees, another mountain in Europe, of course. Thus, what's happening in this situation is that we can say that a map, even a bad one, can help organizations to cope with threatening and uncontrollable nature of the unknown. And this is why in this course we, will, we are showing to you a set of maps and those those maps will help to you to get your way out of the unknown or unstable context situations.